Thin layer chromatography, also called TLC, is a tool that's used routinely in the organic chemistry lab. Like all chromatographies, it utilizes a two-phase system, a stationary phase and a mobile phase, and the components of a mixture will separate uh, as they partition between these two phases. Now in TLC, the most common stationary phase we use is silica gel. This is an example of silica gel. You can see it's a really interesting powder, kind of freely flowing. Uh, alumina is another possible stationary phase that's uh, commonly used. But we're going to use uh, silica gel, this is SiO2 is the formula for this. And in thin layer chromatography, the silica gel is deposited as a thin layer onto some kind of solid support. And so this is an example of uh, a TLC plate. This one is backed with aluminum, but it could be uh, plastic backing or even glass backing. This is the most common size we use, or maybe even a little smaller in the lab, but it's possible to get larger sheets, this is a 20 centimeter square, and uh, we could use this whole square, or we could cut it up into various sizes, depending on how many samples we would like to take a TLC of uh, and compare at the same time. <clears throat> so what we're going to be doing is taking our sample, we're going to be uh, placing a small amount of that sample onto the TLC plate, and then we're going to place the plate into a solution, organic solvent, and that solvent is going to uh, rise up through the plate by capillary action and as it does so it's going to carry the co compounds that we spotted on the plate and it's going to separate the components uh, as those components partition between the the, the solvent which is called the mobile phase or and the si silica gel which is the stationary phase. So let's talk about the developing chamber. This is what we would use to develop or, or run the TLC. Uh, it's nice to have a jar or something like this with a nice flat bottom and a lid so that we can keep the uh, solvent contained within and, and the vapors uh, stop them from evaporating. What we most typically use, especially in a teaching setting, is something like this. We can make our own chamber by uh, taking a large beaker and filling it uh, with placing some solvent in there. Notice I put a few filter papers in here and these are used uh, to get saturated with the solvent and therefore the entire chamber will get saturated with vapors. We could use a watch glass to cover it up to minimize escape of those vapors and we want to have a really saturated environment so as the solvent rises through the plate it doesn't simply evaporate, it will stay wet the entire time. Okay and Let's uh, make up our developing chamber. What we typically do for TLC is we use a mixture, a combination of solvents, and uh, that way we can adjust the polarity of the, of the eluent, the, sol the solvent mixture we're using to develop the TLC. Uh, we, can we can adjust its polarity to be exactly what we want because it's the polarity of the compounds, the differences in the polarity that are going to uh, give rise to a difference in the, the rate at which they move up the TLC plate. So what I have here are ethyl acetate and hexane. Those are very common solvents to use in a TLC. Let's make up a 10% solution of ethyl acetate and hexane. So it's going to be mostly hexanes. I'll do 9 milliliters of hexane approximately. And <clears throat> uh, 10 milliliters is all I would need to fill a, a pretty large developing chamber like this. So don't make up too much of this solvent mixture. And it's also important to have to make the solvent up fresh because the solvents evaporate at different rates and so the developing chamber that I make in the morning is not necessarily going to be the same composition later that afternoon. So I'm going to pour this into the developing chamber and I'm going to swirl it around to get the filter papers nice and wet with the solution. Let that sit for a little while to get it nice and saturated in there, kind of like humid you might imagine on a, on a humid day that where the uh, atmosphere is, is saturated with water vapors. And next let's take a look at our TLC plate and see how we're going to uh, prepare that. The TLC plate can be written on directly uh, very lightly with a pencil and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a mark on where I'm going to place my sample on the TLC plate and I want to make sure that that mark is high enough on the TLC plate so that it's going to be above the 
level of the solvent in the developing chamber. If the spot were below that, then when I place this in the developing chamber, my compound would simply dissolve away in the solvent and we wouldn't be running a TLC. So we'll spot it just above it. We'll label our spot. Um, what am I doing? Well, let's call this compound X for now, sample X for now. And I'm also going to make a note at the top of the plate. Remember, we used a 10% ethyl acetate hexane mixture because we might be experimenting with several TLCs today and several solvent combinations. And so uh, if we have a lot of TLC plates, we want to know exactly what's on each of them. Now, how do we get our sample onto the uh, silica gel? Well, the procedure is the same whether our sample is a solid or a liquid. We want to make a solution, a very dilute solution of that sample. And so we want to do about a 1% solution. So here I have a solid. I, I weighed out about 10 milligrams just so we could have an idea of, of what that looks like. If I were to dissolve that in one milliliter of solvent, then that would be about a 1% solution. And um, we can use any organic solvent for this because we're going to use this solution to transfer onto the plate and then we're going to let that solvent evaporate. So that solvent is not going to have any effect on the, on the actual TLC that we're running. Now, even if you have a liquid sample, it's tempting to imagine placing the liquid uh, or oil directly onto the TLC plate, but we wouldn't want to do that because that would really overload the uh, TLC plate. You really want to make sure it's a, um, a dilute solution. So I have a solution here, and I'm going to use a very, very tiny capillary tube to um, transfer the solution. Now, this is called a micropipette. It's so small. You can imagine a big pipette we would use, and we, just like this, we need a bulb to draw up the liquid and a bulb to um, force the liquid out. Well, in a micropipette, in this tiny little capillary tube, the, salt, the, the solution is just drawn up by capillary action, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch it so very so quickly onto the TLC plate, and just by touching it, some of that solution is going to get drawn onto the plate, and now I've just transferred some of my sample onto the TLC plate. That's called spotting the TLC plate. And we can blow on it a little bit to make sure that the solvent is uh, evaporated. And sometimes we want to uh, determine that we've put on enough sample there. Is, is it concentrated enough? Um, maybe we need to add more. If it's too dilute, we can simply spot th that same spot again, and it would be twice as concentrated. But let's just take a quick look and make sure we've put on enough uh, sample there. What I have here is a UV lamp, and a UV lamp is a very common way to visualize the compounds that are on our TLC plate. The silica has been treated with a special uh, uh, fluorescent compound, and so when I view this under a UV lamp, see this, the plate shows up green, and right here where I've spotted my compound, I see kind of a bluish, purplish spot. So in fact, I, I do know that something's there, even though I can't see it uh, when, when the light's off. So it's very handy to have a pair of forceps when we're doing a TLC, so that we can easily put our sample in and out of the developing chamber. Let's make sure it's nice and wet. And I'm going to place that right in here, lean it up against the wall and we can watch the solvent slowly rise up again. Just by capillary action, that solvent is rising up the TLC plate. It's passing through the spot of compound that we placed on there, and uh, the components of our mixture are going to be partitioning between the stationary phase, the silica gel, and the mobile phase, the solvent, and since they have different affinities for both, they're going to travel at different rates, and we're going to be separating the mixture of, of compounds. Now, how far up do we need the solvent to rise? Uh, it, the, uh, we need to let it rise enough to get a good separation, and there's no uh, real good rule of thumb for where that is. It certainly doesn't need to go all the way to the top of the plate. This is, this is quite a, a long plate. The longer we let it go, the more diffu diffuse the spot becomes, and so sometimes that makes it uh, uh, some spots might run into each other. So you want to make sure if we're spotting multiple solutions, we want to have a, a decent distance between them so they're not going to run into each other. Um, but just like if you might imagine a marathon race, we have all the runners starting out at the starting point, and as they go, over time, they start over distance. They separate based on the speed of the runner. So the longer we let them run, the more of a separation we're going to get between the fast runners and the slower runners. So the same thing, we want to let this rise a fair amount so that we uh, give it an opportunity 
to separate into different spots. Okay, let's let that go where it is just so we can see what we have so far. Now, what's important is I need to know how far the solvent has traveled because I want to compare the distance that the spot traveled to the distance that the solvent traveled. That's a measurement we can take on the TLC called the RF value. So when I take this out of the developing chamber, I'm going to immediately, again lightly with a pencil, make a mark of where the solvent uh, came to. Because as the solvent evaporates, it's no longer going to be obvious where that line was. So we'll immediately mark it with a pencil. We'll let this evaporate a bit. And then we're ready to visualize it again with our UV lamp. And now we can see, in fact, our single spot has separated into a few spots, at least a few spots. And what I'm going to do is, while the UV lamp is on, is I'm going to circle what I see so that when I turn the lamp off, I can still, uh, I can still know where those spots are. Okay, the last thing we can do is we can measure the distance that these spots traveled. I have two spots, so one thing I've learned about my solution is that it's not a pure uh, solution of a single compound because I have at least two spots here and at least two compounds. And I can report the RF for each spot. What I'm going to measure is the distance that the solvent traveled. That's from the origin up to the solvent uh, front and that's about four centimeters. And then I measure the distance that the spot traveled. So this spot traveled uh, right to the middle, about two centimeters, let's just estimate here. And so the ratio of the spot to the solvent front is two over four or an RF of 0.5. And we can see that the second spot uh, has a lower RF, it did not travel as far, and that is about uh, one centimeter over four centimeters, so the hazard RF approximately 0.25. If uh, the RF values are anything between zero and one, if our spot traveled at the exact same rate as the solvent, went all the way up to the solvent front, we would describe that as having an RF of one. And if the spot stayed at the origin and never moved at all, then it would have a distance of zero and it would have an RF of zero.